Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and uh, fellow archival enthusiasts. Um, welcome to the British Library, um, whether you're here in the auditorium or watching online. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pledge, and I'm lead curator for contemporary archives and manuscripts at the library. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce this event, the fight for animal rights, Kim Stored in con con Conversation. Uh, this event accompanies the library's wonderful new exhibition, Animals, Art, Science and Sound, which has been very well received, uh, and you can book tickets uh, on our website. There's also a free companion display in, the tre in our Treasures Gallery, um, Animal Rights from um, the Margins to the Mainstream, uh, which draws on published, handwritten and ephemeral works from the library's collections relating to animal welfare. It's open until the 9th of July. So to introduce the panel for tonight, um, Kim Storwood is an author, independent scholar, consultant, and speaker on animal rights. He has more than 45 years of personal commitment as a vegan and professional experience in leadership positions with some of the world's foremost animal advocacy organisations. He's a consultant with uh, TM Resht, Zurich-based uh, animal law organisation, on projects preser preserving animal rights history. Uh, the British Library acquired the Kim Stewart Archive in September 2000, uh, 2020. Sorry. Um, Paula Sparks is uh, chair of the UK Centre for Animal Law, a visiting professor in animal welfare law at Winchester University, and a retired, very important, barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. And finally, the chair for, sorry, the chair for tonight's event is Anat Pick. Uh, Anat is reader in film at Queen Mary University of London. She is author of Creaturely Poetics, Animality and Vulnerability in Literature and Film, and co-editor of Screening Nature, Cinema Beyond the Human. Um, um, and also, um, Religion in Contemporary Thought and Cinema. She has published widely on animals in film, vegan philosophy, um, and she is currently writing a book on Simone Weil and cinema. So without further ado, um, enjoy the evening, and over to you, Annette. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I hope everybody can hear me. It's great to see you here. Um, so we have an hour and a half for um, a conversation and what, just in terms of housekeeping, I will begin by um, addressing several questions, probably a couple of questions to each of you in the panel. Um, and then we'll leave about 30 minutes for uh, an open conversation, comments, questions from the audience here uh, and people watching uh, online. For questions here, we have a roving mic, and people um, who are watching online, please put your questions and comments in the chat. Okay, so let's get started. So Kim, I'll, I'll start with you, naturally, and I want to begin by asking you to provide some context uh, for, the, for the archive. First, maybe tell us a little bit about how you came to animal rights, your personal history with it, and then how you, um, how did the archive come about? And I guess I'm particularly interested in whether this was an accidental accumulation of materials, or did you know, or when did you know that you were actually building an archive? Well, uh, 50 years ago this summer, I was a student, and I ended up working in a chicken slaughterhouse. Um, and I wasn't killing the chickens, I was working on the post-killing part of the production line. And that led me to become a vegetarian at the beginning of 74, and then I became a vegan at the beginning of 76, and then began to work for Compassion World Farming in 1976. And in the mid-70s, as I was getting involved, I joined organizations, and at that time, before the internet, um, you know, you just wait to get information in the mail. And I would collect the, the materials and because I was reading them and using them. And then as my uh, career, as it turned out, working for animal rights organizations developed and bon my volunteer volunteerism developed, I kept accumulating materials and I was producing what was called the Coordinating Animal Welfare Bulletin. So I knew, had to know what was happening and uh, keep record of it so I could refer to it and write stuff up. And that was the beginning of the archive. But there was no awareness on my part, there was nothing clever in my thinking that this was the beginning of an archive and that it would eventually someday end up in the British Library. I mean, that was just beyond my comprehension at that time. But it was just a useful way to keep the information so that I could use it to further the argument for animal rights. Mm. 
but I suppose you must have had some kind of a, I suppose, historical consciousness of some sort, understanding that there was significance in keeping a historical record of the movement in which you were taking part. Um, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about what you see the archives function as, what do you hope that it will do? And, and specifically, actually, in terms of its place in the British Library, um, what does it mean to you, this kind of formal recognition by an institution like the British Library, um, recognizing animal rights as, as, a, as, a, as a meaningful social issue? There was no historical awareness on my part of the importance <laughs> of keeping a library in an archive. It was, just didn't exist. It was, it was a practical tool which, in, in the course of time, fed my perhaps uh, obsession to want to collect things that I'm interested in. And um, there certainly was no, uh, nothing driving, uh, driving me to think in terms of, of, oh, wouldn't it be great if, if the archive ended up somewhere that someone could actually use it more, more than I could. Um, but it reached a point whereby uh, there was so much stuff that I had to uh, you know, rent an office and to keep it in, or it went into storage. And, and then eventually I reached a point of age where I think, well, I've got to find somewhere for it to go because um, I need to know where it goes. I need to, I need to be the decision maker about where, where it's going to end up. And um, I was very fortunate that um, I was introduced to the people here, the folks here, at the British Library by Catherine Oliver, who had done some work for the uh, Ryder Archive, the Richard Ryder Archive. And that began a conversation whereby I pitched uh, myself and my archive to, to Jonathan at a meeting here and said, I have this collection. Um, I think it's very important. I think animal rights is very important. And I would love for the British Library to have it. And we went through... Uh, a long process whereby they, uh, Jonathan and his colleagues would come down to my office in Hastings. We would look at the materials um, and we eventually concluded with their decision to say that they would take certain amount of the material and I had to make the decision that the archive would be broken up. And I was very much against that originally. I wanted to keep the whole thing intact. Um, but then I realized that um, the, I'm, I'm a big fan of Virginia Woolf, for example, and I realized that there were collections of Virginia Woolf in different locations in, in America and in, in Britain, and that it was okay for the material to be broken up. Mm -hmm. So the research materials came here, um, which I'm very pleased with, and uh, the rest of my collection is going to Tiermrecht in Zurich in Switzerland, which I'm equally pleased about as well. Okay, and by research materials, well, we're going to look at some items shortly, but by research materials, you mean, can you explain exactly what that research is? Research materials are working files. So there was uh, more than 800 files that I had built up over time. They were sorted into three primary categories. One was by subject, uh, one was by organization, and one was by person, by people. And they were files that I kept and maintained because I used them um, with the various projects that I was working with. And it was a way to sort and keep material so I could easily locate it. Um, so those files have come here. Um, the library also acquired um, some dozen plus uh, uh, annual uh, diaries or, or uh, appointment books, uh, as well as some dozen plus address books. Um, so these were all materials that kept track and record of, of the work that I was doing. And then also two old laptops so that they could download um, digital files. And the, these were the, the research materials yeah. which, which the library have taken. And, and what, what would be, so how do you see the, the uh, archive now that housed in the British Library contributing to the movement going forward? What, what do you hope its use and function will be to, who do you think is it's going to um, cater for? Are we talking about activists, scholars, 
Um, well, who I think it should cater for and who will actually use it are going to be two different groups of people. <laughs> because there is the, I think that um, people in the movement should use it more than I suspect they actually will. Um, and I would encourage them to actually do that. Because how can we know what future we want for animal rights if we don't know what our past is and what's happened in previous to our involvement? But I think that mostly um, it's going to be uh, academics, I think, initially, who are going to use it. Uh, but I'm hoping that it's going to be a broad cross-section of people who want to understand what the uh, long-term uh, social justice movement for animals has been about, what its history has been, uh, where it has succeeded, where it hasn't yet succeeded, who the key players were. This is very important to know all of this, because otherwise, how can you know where you're going if you don't know where you come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. It's something I'll, I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, a, a sense of uh, an overview of history of the movement. Um, I think because of the times in which we live, which are not especially uh, cheerful, um, I think it's interesting to think about. You know what? What is it that we see when we look at the archive um, overall? Uh, but we'll we'll come back to that. Um, Jonathan, if I turn to you next um, as the archivist, uh, for those of us who are not familiar with the mechanics of acquiring an archive uh, at, in the British Library, can you tell us a little bit about what that entails? And uh, I, I imagine it's painstaking and kind of a gargantuan task. And from the British Library's perspective. What does it mean to have this archive here? Uh, and where, is it, where does it fit amongst the other collections at the, in the library? OK, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, so and, just, and also just to very quickly pick up on a point Kim made that he said, well, this is a research archive. But for us, um, it also contains like a, historical, a historical narrative. And it, it, contains, it contains an individual's work as well. Um, and so this is one of the things we're, we're sort of looking for in an archive. So um, we're looking for evidence of the individual, evidence of their work, um, what they've achieved. Um, because if it was just research material, that could be, I mean, everyone has research material. So we're actually looking for the individual. And this is why we spent such, well, quite some time actually visiting him, going through the archive and identifying what we thought were the sort of core, the core, and I know Kim, likes to think of the archive as not necessarily about him, but that's, <laughs> that was kind of what we were, we were looking for in terms of, um, because it's his life's work essentially, uh, building yeah. this archive. And one of, them, one, one of the conversations I had with Kim, I said, well, you know, were you interested in collect, uh, building an archive? And I think as, as he's mentioned, he wasn't initially, but then, and you could sort of tell because he'd started wrapping things in tissue paper and it was, you know, there was evidence that he was sort of, <laughs> trying to preserve something, so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was an interest. It was very interesting archive to go through, and then, I, as he mentioned, we identified these three, these three, um, the three main series plus some other bits and pieces. Um, I'm not sure if that's answered your question. No, very much so. And but it's interesting that in a hundred years, maybe you know, the archive will, whoever's going to look at the archive might see something different, might see a, a, a more individual, a story of an individual. Uh, assuming everyone will be vegan by then, and you know, mm. um, yeah. <laughs> it will be a different kind of uh, re you know resource of, uh, of information. But yeah. anyway, yes, I, the, the first part of my question was about the the, 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 the procedural question. Right. What's, oh yes. What, what does it mean to to acquire an archive at the British Library? Okay. So I mean, the, the process whereby we come across archives varies. So as as Kim mentioned, we were sort of. Um, sort of introduced by Catherine Oliver, who was a PhD student who was actually working on the Rider Archive. Um, um, but, I mean, we also seek out people. We are contacted directly by people. Um, and what we're really looking for is, um, I guess you would say, a sort of unique, um, sort of, uh, you could say an eminent person, but a, and a sort of uniqueness to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to their work. Mm -hmm. um, in a sort of national context, in just British life, and sometimes in international context. Um, just to quickly turn back to Kim's, uh, Kim's archive, he also had material from that was sort of international in its in its reach. And uh, but the fact that he 
been involved in um, animal rights in the US um, was actually of, of great interest to us as well. Right, right. Um, so maybe we can look at a few yeah, items that you've chosen to, to illustrate what the archive actually looks like. So I'm just okay. So these are these items. are these are my favourites. I'm not saying this is the. <laughs> All right. So um, this is um, animal activists from 1978-79. Um, so this is actually quite a small pamphlet. Um, what I I really liked about this was um, it's created very very simply. So it's um, if anyone some people might be old enough here to remember letter sets. So it's a rub on lettering. So that's how they've done the headline. Um, they've used a typewriter to um, do, the, do the body text. Um, you've then got a, a magazine article, oh, sorry, a picture cut out of a, a magazine probably, and then someone's used a sort of um, a rotary pen to give it a sort of professional edge, and then you've got a little um, um, uh, logo in the bottom, bottom right-hand corner. Um, so it's actually quite visually sophisticated for this, for this time. Um, um, so, and um, yeah, I, I just thought it was a very, very sort of beautiful item in its own, in its own way. Um, this is quite uh, an unusual collection of um, uh, pamphlets um, produced by a guy called John Cowan, who was based in Edinburgh. Um, I th I'm fairly sure this was, it was just, just him producing these pamphlets. Um, um, there's no sort of fixed design style, so it tends to, to vary. Um, and <laughs> there's a, quite a deal of humour in, um, in this approach as well, um, which is not something you always, always have. Um, um, and again, it's sort of um, slightly um, left of centre. It's sort of a very, very personal take on, on animal, animal rights, I thought. Um, this is uh, from 1989. This is yeah, a, um, a magazine um, archangel. Um, again, looks quite professional. Um, it's slightly older graphic style, which is so for 1989. Um, this is number one in 1989. Number two came out in 1992, and then we don't have. There's no <laughs> more material. So it shows a lot of these. It's quite a professional presentation, but a lot of these. Um, one of the interesting things is looking through these through the archive is a lot of the. Um, materials are just so created by individuals, um, and you can usually tell because I have a personal address, and it's you know done by Keith and Mary. So it's not a, it's not a very it's it's has an energy that you perhaps don't get with more sort of formal material, which I find very very interesting. Um, this is um, Beast magazine. So there's two I've got two versions of two sort of editions of this, um, the magazine that bites back. Um, this to me seemed quite ahead of its time. So this was 79 and then the next one is from 1980 and you'll see a change in sort of visual style. This is probably a little bit more, um, I'd say grassroots, um, sort of the typography of, of Beast. Um, um, and this was interesting because it was more of an alternative lifestyle magazine rather than a campaigning um, or out and out campaigning magazine. Um, unfortunately, it didn't seem to have a very long life. I mean, I think this was the last Edition, last uh, edition in uh, 1980, but you can sort of see the change in sort of visual style, whether that was because they had different artists working on the covers or whether it was just they were trying to professionalise it. Um, and then this magazine was eventually um, incorporated into another magazine called um, Undercurrents, um, which we have, uh, I think there's a single copy of that, so whether that went any further we don't know. Um, a couple of things from the um, British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. So this is um, yeah, a letter to, from yeah, to Kim, um, and I believe is Jill in there. She is. She's sitting right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amazingly. I didn't know this was just <laughs> it's one of this serendipitous that occurred. <laughs> uh, too late now. <laughs> Um, and yeah, just very, very interesting, um, sort of probably Bauhaus influenced um, <laughs> um, logo. And then um, I think this is 83, you have a more sort of um, organic sort of logo. Um, and you can see they've got a media pack. So this is, there's a sort of a professionalism, I wouldn't say creeping in, but there's emerging, shall we say. Um, uh, this is really interesting. Um, this was <laughs> Stop Magazine by Stop Animal Suffering. Um, it's really interesting. It doesn't seem to contain any original content. So it's basically made by um, 
made from parts of other pamphlets and articles um, and brochures. So it's sort of a, a you know a current compendium um, of animal welfare news. Um, so a really interesting concept. Um, um, and then this is, uh, there's, so there's three, um, so we start with vegan newsletter in 1977. So this is um, sort of hand-drawn, quite naive illustration. Um, and then we move very quickly on to um, a more, a better illustrated volume, I think. Um, it, again, interesting sort of typography. And then um, last on to um, what I think is really lovely sort of hand lettered um, and a really beautiful illustration um, to probably possibly you know influenced by Aubrey Beardsley um, um, and then this is actually people for animals from the US um, so it's about 1990 I think um, again um, use of an illustration and then quote from Descartes um, or Descartes sorry um, uh, yeah, just um, sort of, um, what would you say, very much cut and paste still, in, it's still in 1990, um, but sort of all the more special, I think, for it. Um, and then this is from uh, New Zealand, so Mobilised for Animals Magazine Journal, 1986. Um, so again, combination sort of formal, um, formal heading handwritten text, sort of illustration, so it gives the impression of a collective effort. So actually, very, very, again, very, very interesting, um, very interesting document um, to, 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 from my, my, my perspective. Um, and uh, that's, that's, all, that's all for the moment. So. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Kim, do you want to comment on any of those in particular? I know you had a, um, an anecdote on, on Buav, actually, that involves Paula as well, uh, I the, recall. The, I think the, that uh, a key moment is when, um, in 1981, a group of us won control of the BUAV, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection, which is now Cruelty Free International, and we engaged a professional design studio called Lawrence and Bevan, and Anthony Lawrence and Hilly Bevan are in the audience, and they taught us how to do corporate identity. And that was uh, uh, that really uh, influenced BUAV's growth because it gave us a professional um, look um, that, that was consistent, and and it led to a number of uh, projects being developed. So everything looked as if it came from the same place. It looked professional. It looked believable. Um, I know there is some. Um, some question by some some animal study scholars about professionalism being a bad thing. I don't necessarily think it, it is always a bad thing. Uh, I think it can be a very good thing. And I think that really helped uh, BOAV emerge as a leading organization in, in, the, in the 1980s through the professional uh, work uh, that Lawrence and Bevan did. And, and then I worked with them with other organizations, uh, large and small in Britain and America. And I think that was, that was a key moment as far as helping to position the animal rights movement to be a more credible force. Right, right. Um, I do want to talk about professionalization and so-called mainstreaming in a moment, but um, I also want to ask you a couple of questions, Paula, but am I right in recalling that your introduction to the movement was partly facilitated by seeing those uh, professionalized, professional posters? It was actually, it was completely so because um, I didn't realize until I read, despite knowing Kim, read Grau's book, that he was behind with his team the poster, Every Six Seconds an Animal Dies in a British Laboratory. And it was seeing that poster, I think on a tube station in Camden Town, that really made me think critically about our treatment of animals in society and also about the law because I had always understood and I've been brought up to believe that if you were cruel to an animal, which meant doing the things that were described on that poster, that that would be illegal. And so I found it very difficult. My first reaction was this must be actually propaganda and I don't believe it. And I went home and asked my parents and uh, 
they said, oh yeah, you know, and the reason why these experiments are carried out is, you know, for legitimate reasons and so on. And it, it didn't sit right with me. And it made me question the whole philosophy, I think, about how we treat animals. So that poster spoke very dearly to me. I was really surprised then it came full circle when I learned about Kim's role in it. Mm. So thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you to the people who designed it. Lawrence and Bevan of the <laughs> Wow! <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the last time I saw an anti vivisection poster in the, in the tube. I have seen a fairly graphic one uh, advocating veganism very recently, a very large one as well, but I wonder if the legal landscape is, has changed around uh, the, what type of imagery uh, is in the public space. Uh, I don't know. You, I think the imagery generally is very different now. I think it focuses more on the positives, on showing animals in a good environment, which is the juxtaposition to how many are within the intensive farming system and in other um, forms of exploitation. Um, but the nice thing about that poster was there was nothing graphic in terms of it being gory or difficult to look at. It was a very simple design. It was black and white with a dog. Um, but it was just so effective in getting the message across. And I think it worked really well. I couldn't say whether the, some of the images we saw in this collection work better than the images that we have now and the messaging works differently I don't know but I think that is a legitimate difference that you can spot over the years would you say Kim yes has it changed it has yeah. changed and and uh, I, I think that uh, people activists I don't want to go on about activists nowadays don't know what they missed in the past but I think it's important to understand how uh, it's now un more or less universally maintained, not quite universally, that, that, that people who are active involved with animal groups do know that they need to present uh, a professional image mm. uh, if they want to be taken uh, with credibility yeah. and with seriousness. Um, and, uh, but if they, that assumption, it would be better if that assumption was grounded on, in knowing what preceded their, their activities before then. Right. Okay. Thank you. Paul, if I can um, keep ask you something about the, about the law. So you're, you're a barrister, you practice animal law. Can you, can you explain what animal law is and what its history is? Where it, what is it? Is it, I don't even know, is it a discrete area of law? Where does it come from? Um, and how has it sort of come to be this mm -hmm this thing that some people uh, now practice? Mm. Yeah, well, animal law is very intersectional because, oh, if I'm crackling away there, um, it actually, when we talk about animal law, it's a shortcut, and it's actually the laws that relate to animals, which can be the criminal law, civil law, uh, it can be family law, there may be um, issues as between um, family members who have possession of an animal. So I never actually practiced in animal law. Oh, yes. thank you. It's just, so it won't crackle anymore. <laughs> um, but I do think it's important to understand the history of animal law. And um, there's a, a, an author and an academic, Dr. Simon Brumman, who has asked the question about the importance of the history of animal law um, as part of one of our um, legal series. And he, I think he explains it really well. He says, look, in order to understand the position that we're in now, which is one where animal protection laws are, to a, to a greater or lesser extent, out of kilter with philosophical and scientific reality, um, you have to understand that they're based on attitudes and beliefs, often rooted in religious beliefs from many centuries ago. Um, and that is a point that's also been made by Stephen Wise, who's the founder of the Non-Human Rights Project in America. And he describes laws being rooted in a universe that no longer exists because our understanding has so fundamentally shifted from that time. And this really goes back to Western civilization and the development of that from 
the Roman law, um, the Romans being heavily influenced by Greek philosophers. So the Greek philosophers, such as Aristotle, saw the world in a very hierarchical way. And they regarded enslaved people as living tools uh, because they didn't imbue those people with the same characteristics as themselves. Um, and similarly, animals were not thought to be imbued with those characteristics. They weren't considered as sentient as having intrinsic moral worth. And so the way in which the Romans classified the universe into legal persons and legal things reflected that. So not all humans were legal persons. So a legal person was essentially the, um, the Greek male and then extending down to Greek women and so forth. Um, but enslaved people and animals were on the other side of that wall and were not considered legal persons. And obviously that's changed over time because now all humans are legal persons, but animals are still on the other side of the wall regarded as legal things. And this concept, of this, this hierarchical concept of animals being there for human use was then um, picked up by the early Christians who promoted that concept of dominion over um, um, nature and dominion over animals. And then you had some early philosophers, often quoted um, René Descartes, thinking of animals as autonomous, not sentient living beings, but reacting to various stimuli in the same way as a machine would do. And it's not until you get into areas of enlightenment that you have writers such as John Lawrence um, arguing for some rights protecting animals from being cruelly treated. And then um, Jeremy Bentham saying, well, actually, what are the considerations that should be morally consider considered? And so he, um, with this famous quote, you know, it's not about whether they can talk or whether they can um, theorize, it's about whether they can suffer being morally relevant. And then we have our first um, animal protection law in 1822, brought about by um, um, Richard Martin. We've just celebrated 200 years of animal law, so it's a good timing. That was last year. Mm -hmm. And so there's no, so you're saying that it's the Judeo-Christian, well, Greco <laughs> tradition of, um, that sort of separates humans from everything else. And that kind of binarism that is at the root of some of the problems that we have in, in the law today. Yes, I think and so. And that with the concept of dominion, that we can exploit nature and animals for our own use. And we still have really a, a legal system based on utilitarianism where we balance harms to animals against benefits to humans or it may be harms to animals against benefits to other animals. Um, but we make those choices in rather an anthropocentric way because it's a way to benefit us. And so we can say we can um, justify this disbenefit to an animal that may be a matter of great importance to the animal, including the animal's life or the animal's suffering, but the benefit to us is an economic benefit. It might be about having cheap food um, or it might be about um, conducting a particular type of experiment to learn something that may be only at peripherally to our body of understanding and knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's quite complicated because, I mean, Bentham is considered the father of utilitarianism, we're now celebrating, uh, marking 50 years to Peter Singer's uh, uh, famous essay, um, Animal Liberation. Um, and yet that sort of legacy of utilitarianism is now being, I think, I mean, it's very important that at the same time you're saying it's, it's, it's limiting our ability to, to, to change uh, well, our relationship with animals. I think... It, so far as Bentham and Peter Singer are concerned, what they're arguing is quite right, that there should be equal consideration of similar interests. Yep. So um, the suffering of an animal is equivalent to the suffering of a person. Now, that doesn't always mean that those are treated equally because the suffering to a human 
in some circumstances may be greater because they have a greater capacity for um, either understanding or for having particular interactions with society and with family. So it's not about prioritising one over the other, but it is about moving the dial for animals as well because you are applying those considerations in a morally consistent way. Yeah. So that is a force for good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll come back to uh, the, the potential and limits of, of the law. Um, I want to come back to you, Kim, and um, dig into some of the things you've already started to say about the, this tension between uh, the need to mainstream the movement and the maybe the, the, the kind of opposite need to, to remain uh, oppositional, to, 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 have, to, to have this kind of edge uh, of resistance against the... Um, against the, the kind of the, the norms of, of the day. So I, I, I want to quickly quote you to you. Uh, in an essay that you wrote uh, about the great uh, writer and uh, animal advocate Bridget Brophy, you, you say that, and I quote, the single greatest challenge confronting animal rights is making the moral and legal status of animals a mainstream political issue, end quote. And I think that clearly the, the British Library's acquisition of, of the, the archive could be construed, I mean, it is uh, a f one form of mainstreaming, right? It's institutionalizing uh, the archive. At the same time, though, as I said before, we're living in a, I think we, we can agree we're living in a, in a moment of serious crisis, perhaps irreversibly. Um, I think we're experiencing it at all levels, environmentally, politically, socially, culturally, morally, a real catastrophe um, in relation to the way we, uh, where we find ourselves in the world and our relationship to animals and, and the natural world. So um, I guess my question is, can you think a little bit about um, this tension between the need to mainstream and professionalize and maybe even marketize or um, become more sort of corporate uh, as a movement? Um, and the risks that this brings, uh, the risks of appropriation, of diluting the message, of being co-opted by uh, you know, neoliberal uh, policies, by capitalism. Um, I, I think this is a, something that we as, as sort of animal people struggle with a lot. And I, I wonder you know, what you think about that, about that tension between the margin and the mainstream. Well, I think the tension is a good thing. I think there needs to be a tension between the mainstream and the fringe. Um, I think we need both. And uh, one helps the other. Um, so I, I don't see them as oppositional things. Um, they, we need to have messaging for animal rights that comes across as part of the mainstream. And we also need messaging coming across that, makes it, that, that maintains that it's still a, a fringe issue, that it's a, it's a radical issue. Um, I, um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a, a dance that we have to play as animal activists, that we have to play the society and the systems within society to, uh, to make the messaging that we want to make for animals. And if, if, if some people want to do messaging which is um, fringe-based, then let them get on with it. I may not always agree with everything, but th th I'm fine generally with it happening, but there's also messaging that we need to do from the mainstream. And, and it's exciting for me to see the British Library um, present with pride the fact that it's acquired materials that, that Jonathan has just shown us, yeah. which are from the fringe. So I think it's possible to accommodate both. Um, what I think we need to avoid is um, one attacking the other. Um, and we all get tempted to do that. I know I am the first to complain and criticize about anyone doing anything in some respects. Um, that's the nature of things for me. But, uh, you know, I think generally um, we need both. We need to have the messaging from the mainstream and from the fringe. Um, and uh, the, the, the fact that we're here today is, is a brilliant example of that. I'm never going to compromise my vegan animal rights messaging. And I, you know, I'll use this platform to make that message. And if that's too radical for the British Library, then... 
so be it. You know, they, I'll be leaving later. They can get on with their lives. <laughs> but we need both. We need mainstream messaging and uh, the fringe. And can you venture a guess as to what, what is this strange moment that we live in culturally where these messages are part of the public conversation? I mean, this is a question to everybody. Um, and yet the situation objectively, statistically, is not especially uh, encouraging, yeah. let's, let us say. But, but people are, you know, most people are aware of, at least if not animal rights and animal welfare, um, veganism is kind of everywhere. Uh, yeah, I wonder what everyone well, thinks about. Before I, the others drop in, I want to say that the, there, there is this sort of strange dilemma, this tension between the mainstream and the fringe. And um, uh, we've only got to look at some art to know that it's very much construed as being, at one point, being on, on the extreme, but then it becomes accepted within culture um, some decades later. Um, what was hitherto thought to be outrageous and extreme uh, becomes accepted and becomes of great value to society. And the, there are signs every day of animal rights being generally accepted. Um, and the, the question I think you keep coming to is, you know, is this happening quickly enough, given the overall circumstances of what that we, that the planet faces in terms of the climate crisis? And, you know, is it too little, too late? Um, you know, we all have, a, I think, our opinions about whether we're optimistic or pessimistic about the future. I'm very clearly pessimistic about the future. And, uh, but that doesn't mean to say that I will ever stop doing my animal rights work every single day. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jonathan, do you have an archivist, uh, archival perspective well, on this um, question? Well, the live, we're not a campaigning organization, no. so we have to make that clear. So, <laughs> um, uh, again, I think I've mentioned our, our interest is the sort of um, the historical record um, and how it does fit with the, our other collections. Obviously, we have the Richard Ryder collection. He was also a campaigner. So, it, um, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's really our interest. So, and just to provide researchers um, or, and members of the public with the opportunity to look at material that sort of a, well, a historical narrative based around, in this case, an, ind an individual and the collection of an individual. So. Right, but I suppose, um, when, by the way, when was the Ryder Archive uh, acquired? Uh, well, it's been acquired in five tranches, so starting in 2005, I believe, and then okay. 2010, 2015, 2000 and I think 20, 2022, I think that's five, but that's, yeah, it was every sort of, he just phones us up. And <laughs> yeah, and would you say that acquiring these archives in the 21st century does suggest that, you know, that the library recognizes that there is something valuable here, uh, that the issue is, is valuable, whereas perhaps in the past it, it wouldn't have been recognized as such, or is that not? Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, because there, were, there is, I mean, we hold material by George Bernard Shaw, and you know, there's, there's. I mean, if you look at the um, for margins to the mainstream, the little exhibition, we'll yeah. show you. We we hold lots of material dealing with the history of yeah. um, animal rights, um, and that was current once. So, um, so it's perhaps it's perhaps it's um, it's the first time we've had people who solely you know work around animal animal rights in, in terms of our movement. Um, yeah. I mean, there was a situation that we had where I, when I was working in America recently, I acquired a collection of more than 200 pamphlets that were printed uh, mostly in the late 1800s. And I gave uh, Jonathan yeah. the imagery of this, of this collection and he and his colleagues cross-checked it against the, the, the stock that you have here. Mm. And of those more than 200 leaflets, some of which were very rare, they had all of them except for three. And I was absolutely amazed that, 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 that this was the case. And it was great relief to me to know that, that, um, that this was the case. And so it spoke to me to help me understand 
more, even more so, the importance of working with institutions like the British Library, um, to, to, that they already have a lot of material that we as animal rights activists should know about that is mm. part of our past. Yeah, and they, that exhibition does really illustrate the importance of that in the wider context of 19th century history in, in, in the United Kingdom. So yes, that, that makes absolute sense. Um, Paula, what about you as a, as a legal practitioner? How do you see, I mean, we hear a lot about activist lawyers these days, but is there a, how, how do you sort of reconcile, if, if you do, the, the, the desire to, to, to advocate for animals and, to, uh, and then the, the limitations of, of uh, the legal profession mm. and legal norms? I suppose one, one thing that comes to mind is, I think over the past decade or so, there's been this tension between those who say, um, you know, you should be fighting for animal rights and you should be supporting veganism and looking at the philosophies underlying the animal protection laws we have and those on the other side who are trying to develop the laws incrementally and achieve better welfare through incre incremental legal reform, which is really what we have. Yeah. And I think actually, we, you know, we probably come to the point where we recognize that's a really futile approach, that actually you should be doing both, that you should be actively seeking to improve where you can and where the opportunities arise. But also it's appropriate to question the philosophies behind our laws and to um, look at areas where there should be structural legal reforms within society. So we've recently had the sentience legislation that's been enacted, but actually hasn't been brought into force. But nonetheless, if it is brought into force, <laughs> hopefully, um, will provide a mechanism for greater political visibility of animal interests so that in the future, there is a mechanism for ensuring that those interests are taken into account. So I think that we should be bridging that gap and that we should be doing more because, as you say, time's running out to actually make those fundamental shifts. I think that we need, you know, we're faced with the biodiversity crisis, loss of species, and so we need to be looking at how we can better protect those interests. Right, yeah. Um, so you're saying there's a kind of feedback loop between the legal system and the, the culture at large, and when things become culturally unacceptable, that would lead to better enforcement of laws that already exist to protect animals? Well, I mean, enforcement is a general issue. There is a pro problem with enforcement of many animal welfare laws. Um, there are issues around funding and expertise from local authorities. You know, they've got a myriad of other issues that they're confronted with from an enforcement point of view. Um, but also, law's not going to change in a vacuum. You need public support for the laws. It's not the law imposing a set of values on society, but society willing to um, accept the incremental changes that I think people are advocating for. Okay, and, and one, one last question to you about uh, the law, are there any other legal traditions outside of the UK, maybe mm. Europe, that we should be looking to uh, that could provide us with new opportunities for protecting animals? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, even within Europe, um, Spain's recently amended its um, civil and criminal codes to reflect that animals are sentient, so they're a different type of property rather than simply legal things like your mobile phone and your ta table and chair. Um, Ecuador, um, in their constitution, they've recognised the rights of nature and that gives some concrete um, rights to wildlife and that also supports indigenous communities who rely on the forests for sustainability purposes. So, you know, that has human-animal benefit. And the Non-Human Rights Project, um, trying to expand through the courts this concept of personhood to animals who demonstrate a degree of self-awareness according to the science. Mm. So there are movements, and I think it's about having those conversations about what works well, 
and what further protections we can provide that will change the dial for animals. Okay, and do you see that as a direction that this is where the legal profession here is, is moving in that direction, would you, would you say? Um, I think we really need to have those conversations. I think we need to be starting to have more debates around these topics of um, personhood, about the property status of animals. Um, I'm not sure that we would see the courts expand the definition of um, uh, personhood to animals, but it may be that there is a scope for, say, um, political change, as there has been in Spain, to recognise animals as um, more than legal things. So, you know, but we need to actually start engaging with the debate about the mm. philosophical ab um, avenues for change, as well as the incremental legal reforms. Okay, thanks. And before we open it out, um, maybe a last question to you, Kim, sort of looking ahead. Um, I mean, the archive is a record of the past, but I think it, what it, its purpose, I suppose, is to really uh, enable us to have visions, uh, alternative visions for the future, uh, our future relationship with animals. So in that sense, uh, the archive, although it's sort of rooted in, in history, is kind of future facing. At least that's how I think about it. Um, where do you see animal rights going next? What do you think we should be doing? Well, where I see it going next and what I think it should be doing next are two different things. Um, what I think it should be doing is the quote that you quoted back to me from the Brophy article, which is that I think that what we need to do is to make animal rights a mainstream political issue. And, you know, the, there's, animal law is very important, and I never won't say otherwise, but we, the, the step before animal law is the political step, is how do we get the laws on the books that we want animal lawyers to enforce? And there needs to be a paradigm shift from the people who profit, frankly, from abusing animals, deciding what the law of the land is as it relates to animals, to the law of the land for animals being, being written and passed by people who don't have that vested interest. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a massive paradigm shift. So in short, I think what we need to do is to get involved with the political process and, and elevate the issue of animals so that it becomes a mainstream political issue. And I think that that really chimes with um, developments in, in academia, in my, my field, animal studies or critical animal studies. Um, animal politics is now a major a uh, major area of, of animal studies, people thinking about how to bring animals into the political community. And there are, of course, political parties that are, uh, that, that, that are political, that, that are animal uh, parties, um, thinking about not only making animals into persons, but making, making them into citizens. Um, so I think these are, uh, I mean, perhaps slightly ut utopian, but uh, really necessary and and, and promising areas of uh, research and activism and, and political and, and politics. Um, okay, I think that we were pretty much on time. Uh, maybe it's time to open it out. Uh, we have a roving mic, so it'd be great to get some comments, questions uh, from people in the audience. And then there's also, I think, Oh, Brett's here with uh, the occasional question from people online. So, um, who wants to who wants to start? Hey, we have oh, we have, we have quite a few. So there was a uh, person here. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, uh, Ian McDonald. I, I do the vegan option. Did a radio history. I'm wondering. Uh, I mean, question for for Jonathan. Where are the gaps in the archive of zines? and magazines and publications because I know this this pattern of new magazine new public vegan or vegetarian publications starting up being merged into others managing a few issues was there in the 1840s and 1850s as much as in the 1980s so what's missing what should be be, be looking in our in our corners for 
gosh. Oh. <laughs> um, so you mean, you mean what should you be looking for, or what? Or what, 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 what are we missing as 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 a um, uh, well as the British Library as the custodian of what we remember? Um, I'm forever haunted by the loss of the Kandahar edicts of Ashoka Moria, uh, but that's not your problem. No, um, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, my my sort of section is archives, politics, and public life. So, I mean, the British Library's we've got vast collections of material. So, um, so we'd actually need the um, curator for um, <laughs> a published collections here to tell you to tell you what we're missing. Um, often we don't know until we come across it. So, I mean, until we came across Kim's archive, we weren't aware of. So, for instance, Beast magazine, we didn't have any any copies of that. We had no record of it. We didn't know about it. Um, so it's a, it's was very very interesting. You know, it's something we we didn't know existed. So usually we, if from in an archival sense, we rely on um, just finding finding collections or people coming to us saying, "I've got this material. Is it of value? Do you have it?" Um, and if we judge that there's a value to it, then we'll we'll acquire it. Um, doesn't happen on every occasion. Often, as Kim mentioned earlier, we, we hold a lot of material. Um, sometimes you're surprised, actually, that um, at what we actually hold ourselves. I mean, we're actually the curators themselves, because obviously it's been collected over, you know, decades, essentially. So. Kim, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think, in, for me, the related point is this, is that, and especially in the digital age, it's even more acute, is the issue of organisations as a policy archiving their materials here and now um, and preserving the materials and actually instituting policies within the organisations that, that proactively archive um, publications and everything that they do. Um, because I'm sure that probably a lot of organisations just aren't doing that. And there need to be policies in place which, which commits them to doing it. Thank you. Um, okay, Saka, you got your other yeah, question? Um, hi, um, this is kind of a commentee type question for both Kim and Paula. What both of you said resonated hugely with me. Um, I believe in this ideal utopia. I am a candidate for the Animal Welfare Party. I do believe that change has to come through politics, but equally, do work on the front line, rescuing, sabbing, that kind of thing. So I come across what you were talking about, you know, the laws that are already in place, but not being enforced. I constantly find myself having to talk to, talk police officers through the law that already exists and convincing them that, yes, there is legislation and, yes, you do need to do something. Um, so it's, it, it's this... There's a huge frustration, and I think that I would... I worry that people who are who have a passion for animal rights who who do do rescue aren't really aware of the tools that already exist for us and how we and how they can hope to achieve the utopia without this level of understanding of, of what we already have and i was just wondering because I, I didn't even know you existed until about six months ago um and i was just wondering how we can make to the people who are in tune and open and there and ready, how we can make them more aware of what we have in order then to have more of a grounding to achieve what we haven't. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think we've been um, engaging with you and others around pigeon welfare because that's a big issue. You know, they're off, the pigeons are often regarded as pests. Gosh, and you know, they're... There are issues around what is the law, are they wild birds, are they domesticated birds, what's the protection where they're trapped, and you're on the front line. And I think we've been working to try and develop some resources that will inform people who are working on the ground, but also, and you're already very steeped in it, but others aren't, but also local authorities and police. Um, you know, we, we as an organisation will try and do what we can in terms of legal education around animals. And we are all volunteers. We're all volunteer-led. 
Um, and I think there's a real sense within the legal profession of people who share those frustrations around the treatment of animals who want to give their skills and to do more. Um, and we want to try and empower them to do that. And I think having those discussions and that dialogue between people working on the ground, people who want to use their skills in politics or law or marketing, or those other areas, it's really critical. All of those skills yes. are translatable yeah. into the animal rights world. Yeah. I think it's making that It's connection, isn't it? And I think that's just about visibility, doing more <laughs> as we can. But I think social media really helps. It's one of those areas, actually, whereas there is a lot of negative. It can be really positive as well in terms of making those connections. But thank you, and thanks for the work that you do as well. It's thank amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a question here, and then we'll go on. Kim, you talked about the need to get animals into politics. And um, certainly from the times you and I worked together briefly in the late 1970s, animal rights organisations have been struggling to do that thing with varying success. What could be done better or what could be done next in order to make a real step change in getting in animal issues into the political mainstream? Mm. Jill, thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, well, in the late 1970s, when there were the first of a series of putting animals into politics campaigns that were coalition-led, um, in the 77 general election, I think it was, or 79, 79 maybe, in 83, 84, the, the groups came together and uh, formed a coalition and worked nationally and locally to advance a common platform of issues, a common manifesto of issues. And I know there is uh, research going on now um, to prepare for the next general election to come forward with uh, another updated platform and a coalition of organizations to work for it. So basically, I would say that what the, the movement needs to come together in, in adopting a, a, a shared platform and work nationally and mobilize its supporters to work within the constituencies to argue for the same platform of issues so that there's a pincer movement from national and local going towards the political parties to get them to adopt uh, the issue and recognize that votes matter, that people will vote um, uh, depending upon the political party's views on animals. I think another step that we can do is for people who feel so disposed is to join political parties and work from within. And the major political parties do have uh, organizations within them that work on animal issues so that they can be supported. Um, I know that there are animal political parties. And whilst that's not a route that I would go down personally, I recognize that that's a, that's a way forward that some people want to do, and I'm happy for them to do it. So I think basically it's, it's, it's getting involved with the political process, but more than just at the times of elections. It's, it's in, the times in between elections are as important because that's when the debate needs to happen within uh, constituency political parties and nationally to get the issue debated and raised and understood within their context. And I think that one of the areas that animal studies could really help is, is better, is helping us be more able to articulate the case for animals framed within the political ideologies of the political parties. So to make the case for animals so that it, for people with conservative ears, if you like, that they will hear it and understand it within the political framing of how they see the world and do the same for lib Liberal Democrats and for Labour and for other political parties. Can I just throw in one? I know I'm the chair, but can I just uh, uh, throw in just a super quick comment on that? Another thing is also, as I said before, there, there is within political theory and political science departments now people working on animals. So the work of Siobhan O'Sullivan, the work of Dinesh Wadiwal, the work of Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson, 
There's many other names that I could mention. These are political theorists who are embedding animal work into traditional disciplines. And I think it's really important to every discipline in the university should have animals at its heart, animals and, and the environment. And, and there's a, a real kind of energy right now in politics for some reason. And I think that's, that could sort of flow back into sort of the real politics of people actually, you know, doing the actual work of politics and political parties and, and other um, organizations. But there needs to be, uh, people need to be reading this stuff because it's, it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, well, if, there's, if, uh, if I jump in myself, yeah. there's one book I would recommend that everyone should read, which is Zoopolis by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker, yeah. uh, which the first two chapters is, I think, a brilliantly insightful analysis of where the animal movement is right now, its challenges and strengths and weaknesses, but also it, it, it puts forward an argument as to how to advance animals within the political realm. And it's, it's a very important book to, to read. So Zoopolis by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker. Can I just add to that as well, a plea from uh, my profession. Um, <laughs> you can go to most universities and study law and animals are completely invisible. There are very few universities across the country that offer an animal law module as part of the degree so that you learn about critical animal studies as part of the legal process, as part of legal policy. And one of the reasons I mentioned Dr. Simon Brimmons because he is one of the uh, few who has been teaching animal law for a long time. Um, there are others, Michael Radford, um, Debbie Rook and so on, but you know, it's a handful. I think it's starting to change, but the vast majority you will find very little mention of animals in any context, whether it's family law, criminal law, tort, um, across, and that has to change, as you were saying in politics. It also has to change, I think, with legal studies. In, in, every, in yes. every discipline. So yeah. I teach film and I just push animals in wherever I can. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing literature, it's the same thing. It needs to happen. History, the same. Um, okay, I think we'll take one more question and then go to some online questions and return to... So um, the gentleman with... Yes. Um. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, let's let's stick with the politics. I'm just interested to hear Kim or anyone else just help us think through a little bit the connections between what's happening with the cultural and political uh, uh, interest in doing something about the way we've treated the natural environment um, in the ways that are very familiar. They're seeming to be very familiar to all of us. So, w what are the connections? And how does, how does that sort of new sense of how we've treated the natural world uh, impact um, what we're interested in here, animal rights, the way we treat animals? How, you know, how does, how does uh, this contemporary anxiety about the state of the natural world and the way we've abused it and treated it uh, help or hinder uh, where we are with thinking about animal, animal rights? Uh, l last week, I attended a, a very good conference organised by Compassion World Farming, which was, which was, what was it called, Extinction or Regeneration? And I was very tempted to say, well, it should be called Extinction and Regeneration, but that's another debate. The, um, we have to situate the animal issue within a progressive agenda of change and situate the animal issue so that uh, it is part of the discussion about um, how we're going to feed the world, how we're going to find alternative sources of energy to, from oil and nuclear and so on. Um, and we can do that because I think that virtually everything that, that we as humans do impacts animals. And uh, we just need to bring the animal story out into, into the debate wherever it occurs. That may sound like a sort of very trite, simple, glib answer to give you, but you did ask a very macro question, and I'm trying to give you a, a succinct macro answer back. So I think that to, the, our duty is to position the animal issue within a progressive agenda of change. 
Okay, fair enough. Can you give us one example? Well, food. Food. I mean, the, again, last week at this conference, the message is dr driven home that when we use animals to produce food, it is the stupidest thing that we could even possibly do. Because when we feed food to animals, they uh, waste it. Because when people eat um, the charred remains of dead animals, they're wasting so much feed that's been fed to those animals. It's far better that the land is used to grow food to feed to people directly. Um, before we, I think we just take one question online and then we'll come back to the auditorium as well. Yeah, we've got quite a few online questions, so it can come back to me. Um, so there's a question here from Melda, and they ask, um, as long-term animal activists, how do you emotionally deal with the knowledge of tremendous animal suffering? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, they mentioned that they're a PhD student researching speciesism and animal advocacy, and they find themselves thinking about the suffering of non-human animals. Oh, if only I knew the answer to that question, I would tell you, but there, there is no answer to it other than you live with it every, every minute of every day. Yeah, I think it's a really difficult one, and I think I used to feel more distressed by hearing about the suffering and witnessing the suffering of animals. Um, but now, actually, um, sometimes I find it difficult to process the positive messaging around animals' complexities and their capabilities, because then it reminds me <laughs> of the juxtaposition of how many of them live within intensive agriculture systems and otherwise. Um, so it's tough, and sometimes I think you have to step back and separate yourself so that you can do better long-term for animals, because you can very easily feel overwhelmed or burnt out, and I think we have to also protect ourselves. Maybe can I can I just just add um, Netflix, obviously, but but more seriously, um, I think that individual relationships with relationships with individual animals um, at the micro level that that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are different opinions about domestic animals, and but within the existing situation where uh, I have two cats. Um, in an ideal world, maybe I wouldn't have cats, but um, I do get so much from having a, an individual relationship with these two people, two, these two persons, and that goes a long way in terms of um, helping with burnout and, uh, and trauma. Should we take another one from online before we go back? Sure. There's, um, I enjoyed Kim's book, Growl. Is he working on another book? Oh. Whoever that question came from, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, it so happens. It just so happens. Uh, yes, uh, I'm working and have been for some time and will be for still some time uh, writing the biography of an elephant. And the elephant's name is Topsy. She was very cruelly killed in 1903. Uh, she was an Asian uh, elephant who was captured as a baby in southeastern Asia in 1875, taken to America and was uh, cruelly treated to perform in a circus, um, as is quite common with, with uh, captured elephants. Um, she uh, attacked and killed people, um, and, and I argue that this is done in self-defense, really more than, than in her attacking people per se as such, and I'm um, writing her biography. And it's interesting because on the level of the story being one that's historic, it's about an animal of its past, and, and don't get me started about writing animal biographies because it's a fascinating subject. Um, but I am wanting the one objective with the book is to use the history of Topsy as a vehicle to talk about the status of animals today, not just elephants. Thank you. Um, yes, there's a question there, and I might not be seeing questions in the back. So there's one here, and there's one there. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Close. I work as a paralegal 
interesting, talking about Netflix, my question, um, the first part was to, in 2020, an uh, Academy Award winning documentary came out called My Octopus Teacher. And it's interesting contrasting that within the last year where um, an animal rights issue has occasionally broken into the mainstream media, which is the octopus farm in the Canary Islands um, that is um, being, I'm, I'm not sure it's yet been granted, but it's certainly there's been a lot of money spent to get it to that stage. I thought it was an interesting example maybe to use as a question to say, Kim, you know, from your, um, dare I say, archive and research, um, you know, what would, where similar, um, I don't know, conflicts have arisen like this, would you say is the best way for society to tackle um, these moments of, uh, well, you know, like you kind of reflected on earlier, kind of big agriculture, having the money to uh, to spend on this, and um, Paula, you know, the legal, the best legal framework to tackle um, issues like this, or specifically this one. Thank you. Uh, I wished I knew more about the the intent to create an octopus farm than what I actually do, um, and I would feel a bit more educated to be able to give you a bit more thoughtful answer than what I'm perhaps going to give you now, which is the, um, that these situations need to be called out as publicly as possible in order to draw, att to draw attention to them and to essentially shame the powers that be to, to, to mobilize them to, to make it stop. Um, I wish there was a better answer I can give you than that. Um, <coughs> I think it's, that's what it basically boils down to. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me as a, uh, that us as a species are so innovative in the way in which we abuse animals. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, if only we could turn that off in ourselves, it would be so much, so, so, so wonderful. I was thinking today as I was walking around the exhibit downstairs, the animals exhibit, which I really highly recommend, is that it's such a celebration of animal life. And I thought if only that was all how we saw animals, was a way of celebrating their existence and that we didn't have this dark side to ourselves in, in, in abusing them, that, if only we saw them as, as, as individuals, as life forces to celebrate, that the world would be so much better. Yeah, just, just to contribute on the legal side, um, <coughs> this is one of those areas, I think, where the law is out of kilter with the science and the animal welfare science and our knowledge around the capabilities of invertebrates. So the Animal Welfare Acts of the UK only protect vertebrate animals and then only protect protected vertebrate animals, so a smaller subspecies. But invertebrates really lack legal protections and that's why these developments can occur that um, the science will tell us is outside of their own intrinsic interests. And, and it's, so it's not only the octopus. And if you think about the um, lobsters who are boiled alive or killed in other um, less than humane <coughs> manner, um, they don't have those legal protections that they should. Now, there is some protection on the statute books that don't, um, aren't really enforced around um, lobsters, but the sentience legislation has recently recognised that those um, decapod crustaceans and cephalopods are sentient. <coughs> so they've reflected that in the body of science is pointing in that direction, but the Animal Welfare Acts haven't been amended yet to reflect that and to provide them with some legal protection. Um, so again, it's an area that you know the campaigners are working hard on, ad animal advocates working hard on, and we need public support as well um, to you know move things forward. But there is a gap, isn't there, between those the animal welfare science and the legal protections that need to follow. I knew you'd make a much more sensible answer. No, no, no. <laughs> Long-winded, I think. No, more sensible. <laughs> and for, um, yeah, there was a question there. Thank you. Um, I'm Claire from Humane Society International. Thank um, you very much for a uh, really fascinating conversation. Um, I wanted to pick up on something uh, that you were saying about the, the tension between the margin and the mainstream uh, within the, the history of the movement. Um, and, and talk about a slightly different tension that also exists, which is the one between 
those proposing uh, or leading kind of species-specific campaigning efforts uh, versus a sort of um, application of an overarching philosophy, um, you know, for animal rights. And, you know, whether we like it or not, the reality is we live in a world where all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others when it comes to what, you know, the public and what lawmakers think we should do to protect animals. And that's seen, you know, very acutely in, in things like pest control, of course. Um, so my question, I suppose, for you, Kim, is, you know, in the history of your, you know, looking at your archive and looking back at all the different approaches that have been taken, species-specific or overarching, um, wh what, what's your advice? Do, do we start with where people are, you know, cats and dogs and fluffy, cute things, and, and try to expand people's circles of compassion from those animals? Um, or do we start with, you know squarely bullseye on where the big issue is, you know, intensive animal agriculture, where the, the largest volume of suffering is. Uh, yeah, what would be your advice? Uh, thanks, Claire. Um, uh, my advice is that we just start. <laughs> and in a way, it doesn't matter. On one level, it doesn't matter whether we're species-specific or generally across the, rule, across the board. Uh, I think it's just... I think it's just to do and start and carry on and do everything you can and not get sucked into conversations mm -hmm. about competitions between this and that. Mm -hmm. Now, as a vegan, I'm always going to say things should be vegan and you know, I may not even always um, put into practice the, the answer I've just given because sometimes I think things are... I can see some things happening and think, oh, surely there must be more important things to do than that. Um, but, but really, I think that given the gravity of the situation um, that we face, the, uh, the most important thing is just, is just do, get going. I suppose everyone does their own thing in their own different way. So sometimes a species-specific approach may work and may resonate. And you can um, expand out, as you say. For others, their passion may lie in a different area, and that's all valid and all good, and is all going to contribute to what we hope is a um, more intellectually honest approach. And I think that comes back to that point about ensuring that across education, that we are challenging people to think critically about those differences between species and about our approach. And it's not about pushing any one particular idea, but when you actually look at things intellectually and then you start to work out the answers yourself naturally because that's where the answers lie. Do you think, Anat? I mean, that's how I see things. It's giving people the opportunities to start having the conversations and critically think about animals and how they fit in society. I think also, Annette, I think also the, the issue is um, that I'm not going to... Because if someone spends their time... Uh, trapping and rescuing and, and getting feral cats spayed and neutered, I'm not going to uh, say, what are you doing about chimpanzees? You know, or, or someone who's working solely on chimpanzees, I'm not going to say, what are you doing about cats? I mean, I might say, are you vegan? Because I think you should be vegan. Which I guess suggests that one of the most, again, w without sort of creating hierarchies, but I think the most urgent issue is uh, farmed animals and animal agriculture. So I think if, and that is just not even just for animals, but it's also to do with, you know, it, employment rights, to do with um, uh, capitalism, frankly, uh, things that affect humans and animals both. Uh, and there's also potential there for creating sort of uh, solidarity between human and animal workers, because I mean, anim uh, animal agriculture, animals are laborers, right? They, they work. Uh, they are also the products of work, which means they're a slightly different category of worker. But um, so I think to me, um, veganism is so central, partly because it brings us back to animal agriculture which is so vital at the moment, environmentally, mm. politically, economically. So 
So that would be my, my choice, but, that's, but I totally agree that I wouldn't begrudge anyone uh, you know, about doing anything else because it's, it's all mm. philosophically, theoretically equally important. Mm. Okay, so we have um, two more questions here and then maybe we have some time for a few more online questions. Uh, Sarah? Um, <coughs> Wait, we, we're getting a mic. Uh, if you hold on a sec. Yeah, sorry, this goes in a different direction, but it just crossed my mind. I was recently in New Zealand, and New Zealand has this um, campaign or policy, which is 2050 predator free. And um, wherever I went there, there were traps everywhere uh, for. Um, animals that were predators on native species, birds in particular, and I was, yeah, I was quite shocked how many <laughs> traps there were. And, uh, and I don't know actually whether here in Britain there's uh, um, similar um, campaigns uh, to protect uh, certain species from other species. And New Zealand is also very much about um, yeah, the native and the uh, imported, the, the animals that came with the colonizers and so forth. So I, um, yeah, I don't know what, yeah, I don't know. what my question really, I guess what you think of it and what that does to, um, yeah, campaigning to animals. Because, you know, it's the people that put these traps say they protect animals. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, my the, 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 this is a really important issue, I think, and thank you for raising it. I think there's such a dishonesty behind the argument of, of New Zealand being by 2050 predator free. Because if there was some sincerity behind the initiative, they would be looking at their sheep farming. Mm -hmm. They'd be looking at the intensive agriculture that's going on on the islands there. Um, they wouldn't be that they avoid, they avoid those arguments because there's, they're, they're so financially vested economically in sheep farming. And um, it's, it's a distraction, it's convenience to get away from the, bigger, from the real issues. Um, and um, I think there's also the issue we have to confront that um, the, uh, what's an invasive species anymore? You know, we, the, there's... The planet is constantly traveling. People are traveling, planes are flying, things are moving around the planet the whole time. And uh, just to claim that something is an invasive species uh, and shouldn't be here, and therefore we should kill it or poison it or exterminate it, I think is such a, such a small, narrow-minded mental approach to, 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 to things. And, you know, often... Uh, I was listening to something the other day which talked about someone planting some, I forget now exactly what it was, but for some plants that came from southern Russia 150 years ago, and they were populating their garden with these plants. And my immediate reaction was, well, that's an invasive species. You know, that's something that shouldn't be here. So we're very, we pick and choose what we want to call invasive species. And, it's, and what drives the picking and choosing is the economic convenience of something that we won't really deal with. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> Pred predator free is ultimately human free, right? Um, but, uh, but that's a, that's another discussion. Um, there was another question. Yeah, Emily. Uh, uh, no. Be behind. I'm not Emily. Oh, behind you. <laughs> Is Emily here? Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Better be good, Emily. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I want to go back to Claire's point about um, general campaigns or species specific and to pick up on something that you said, Annette, and that was said earlier. I, wa I want to just kind of finish that circle of thought, if that's okay. That 
In, in choosing how to campaign, yes, as animal campaigners, we have species-specific or more general campaigns. But of course, as has been said quite rightly tonight several times, all of this exists in the broader context. And we also need to keep in mind that public opinion is very often with us, but we exist within systems of governance that are not democratic. And, the, and, and to make that circle complete comes back to your point earlier, Kim, about joining political parties and becoming politically active. Because not only do we take then animal issues into, into political parties, but we also understand and have a voice within those movements that could potentially change the system in favour of making sure that politicians are taking the decisions that people want them to take rather than the decisions that the vested interests want them to take. Thank you. Um, we need to bring this to a close, but maybe we can have a couple of questions together uh, from online and then we'll be at the bar so we can, I think the bar is gonna be open so we can keep chatting over there. So just a couple of online questions. Well, maybe this is quite a big question, but quite a good one to end on because okay. it looks to the future. So it says, how can the lessons uh, from animal rights history be put to best use now? Uh, that is a good question to end on. Kim. Well, we've got to know the history, I think. So the lesson I think that I want to convey more than anything is, is uh, how can we know where we want to go if we don't know where we've come from? Um, it's really quite simple. Uh, and I know when I look back on myself, when I started working for Compassion and World Farming, um, I thought that the issue started because I joined it. <laughs> and, you know, how arrogant could I have been? But I'm sure that's what a lot of people think. And uh, so I think that we have to know the history in order to know where we want to go in the future. Um, and the, the history is so rich and so fascinating. So many intriguing figures, uh, so many stories and anecdotes which, which resonate through to the present. Um, and in, in the, uh, the back of, one, of, the, of the book that I've circulated to everyone tonight, the Preserving the History of the Movement, there's a series of questions basically that sort of test you about the history of the, of the movement. Um, and uh, the more we know about the past, the more we'll be able to inform the future. Thank you. Thank you. Just a very quick question to Kim. You said you were pessimistic about the future. Could you just <laughs> explain? Oh, no. We are doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> You want to leave on a, leave on a positive <laughs> note, don't I you? I just need to know why. Why do I think I'm pessimistic? But why? I take a look around and see what's going on and uh, um, show me where we can be optimistic. You know, I think there's not much to see out there that makes me optimistic. Well, young people are vegan, so many thousands all around the globe. It has become a global village thanks to the internet. And I have never known so many young people who are vegan uh, nowadays. So how can you not see that as a, as, a, as a positive? It is a positive, I agree with you, uh, but uh, it's not enough. But they are the future. I always balk at the argument <coughs> about young people being the future because we were all young once and we're the, we are now the present. and. Uh, our future, you know, we, we haven't created for them uh, a, a fantastic future. I think they are hopeful. <laughs> Naivety <laughs> is a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> but we should end with hope. We're going to end with hope and with kindness. Okay. And hope. So yeah, uh, I just want to I just want to uh, thank the British Library for hosting this event, and thank you, Jonathan Pledge, um, Paula Sparks, and of course Kim Stallwood. Thank you so much for coming.